I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A woman stops at a traffic light and comes face to face with her rapist. What he did to me, he is a monster. How did a sexual predator she helped put away for decades when she was just a little girl walk free and back into her life? He took your virginity. Yes. He's no stranger. He's her own stepfather, and he's got a grudge after she got him to confess. I want to tell my mom. You can't. I'll go to jail. I knew right then and there he was going to kill her. He was going to ever let her tell. I'm in Michigan with a brave woman's fight. I'm going to make sure that he goes back behind bars. A case that will leave you outraged. Why would the parole board want a guy who raped an 11-year-old girl free? This is a travesty of justice. This Hawaiian couple loved one thing more than each other, money. It was really important for them to make sure that everybody knew how wealthy they were. And after scamming over a million dollars with a mortgage scheme, they had disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, Crime Watch Daily teams up with the FBI. Wherever they are, I know in my heart that they're stealing from people. In the search for the island outlaws. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matero with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. This is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today with a story that will not only shock you, but if you're like me, it'll make you angry. A young girl betrayed by one of the people who should have protected her, a parent. And sadly, Tiffany Henderson's nightmare may not be over yet. She was only 11 years old when the devil came knocking at her bedroom door. What he did to me, he is a monster. You don't rape and sodomize and stick instruments in a child. Who was this sadistic demon? He tortured me. I felt like a prisoner. A man who raped and sodomized her virtually every day for almost four years of her young life. I was alone. He abused me every chance he had. It was her stepfather, an ex-cop, a Svengali who could charm the tail off a rattlesnake. What kind of a person does something like that? I don't know how he did half the things that he did to me. Tiffany Henderson says her only comfort growing up was knowing she had sent her ex-cop stepfather, this man, Richard McBrayer, to rot in prison for his horrible deeds. Sentenced to a maximum of 40 years. When they told me that, like, he was going to spend his life in jail, I mean, that that's what I believe. Like, he can't hurt us anymore. For young Tiffany, it meant a new lease on life. McBrayer could never harm her again. Or so she thought. It was Easter Sunday. Tiffany was driving in her car when she stopped at a traffic light. She looked over at the car next to her, and suddenly, the horror of 23 years ago was staring her right in the face. It was the monster, McBrayer. I'm getting ready to turn right, and I look over, and I was just like, wow, you know, that really looks like him. I mean, we locked eyes. I immediately felt something. I know that he saw it. That was me as well. Tiffany had just taken a terrifying U-turn into the nightmare of her past. Do you think he recognized you? Yes, absolutely. Tiffany says she had no idea, but McBrayer had been given his walking papers early by the Michigan Parole Board after only serving close to 22 years. Who do you blame for this? The Parole Board. Tiffany claims she never received notification of his early release, which is required by law. But the Michigan Parole Board insists it did reach out to her, saying the records reflect numerous attempts to contact the victim. Despite those claims, Tiffany tells me she feels victimized all over again. What is it like to see his picture today? He's laughing at me. He's like, I told you I'd get out. What do you see when you look at that picture? A monster. Tiffany says her childhood in hell began right after the ex-cop married her mom. I don't feel like I was ever a kid. He took your virginity at the age of 12? Yes, in many ways. <laughs> it was a long night. And um, 
I didn't get any easier. I put a lot of sexual predators behind bars, but Tiffany's tales of violent rape and endless pain are some of the worst I've ever heard. I was out of my classroom and a teacher came and found me, doubled over on the floor. They had to rush me to a hospital. My bowels were blocked so bad, I almost died. From his sexual abuse? From his sexual abuse. My mother is holding one side of my hand. He's holding the other. He's right there. Right. Pretending that he cares about me, but really just make sure I'm not telling. As soon as she got home, her stepfather's vicious attacks started again. I can't scream. I can't get him off of me. I can't. There's nothing I can do to make it stop. The only way I can make it stop is killing myself. That's it. He won't go away. Nobody will help me. Nobody hears my pain. At first, not even her mother believed young Tiffany's seemingly wild tales of her stepfather's depravity and the countless violent rapes that went on for years. Tiffany did not like him At from all. the get-go. At all. Why did you think that was? I thought she was jealous. Desperate to have someone believe that a man who was an ex-cop was also a sexual predator, young Tiffany hatched a daring plan, even though it put her life in great danger. This is the actual tape recorder you used to record the conversation. Yes. What made you finally decide to do this? And they didn't believe me. And if my own family doesn't believe me, who's going to believe me? This was your one way out of this? Yes. Play the tape. What strikes me is y you sound so young on the recording. I was young. And he's begging you not to do it. What's it like to hear that tape again today? I'm scared for my life. Because if he found out that I did that, that I got him on tape, like, it's like the ultimate betrayal, you know? You took this tape to authorities. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the investigation that brought him down. Yes. When Tiffany played the tape for her mom, suddenly the blindfold came off. I knew right then and there he was going to kill her. He was going to ever let her tell. She told him, I'm going to tell my mom. How did you not detect this? I don't know. I'm, ash I'm ashamed of myself. And there's nothing that any viewer could say that I haven't said to myself. I actually sat and watched shows about moms that had daughters that were abused by husbands or boyfriends. I'd say, God, she had to have known. And I'm ashamed of myself for saying that. Oh my God. Looking back, Tiffany's mom, Stacy Dale, says the sickening signs were all there. Tiffany would excuse herself from dinner. I'm all done, mom. Is it okay if I go out to my room? Sure, Tiff, no problem. And maybe five, 10 minutes later, he'd say, oh, excuse me, I gotta go to the bathroom and he'd rape her in the bathroom, come back down and finish dinner. With her outraged mother at her side, now the pair take the damning recording to Michigan State Police, but it wasn't enough to arrest McBrayer. The 14-year-old would have to set another trap on tape, and this time it was with a ruse that she was pregnant. This is from the State Police Post. Yeah. Hello, Dad. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Mom. I'm pregnant. You are? Yes. Well, when did you find us out? A couple days ago. Are you going to do anything for this baby? I'm going to help you is what I'm going to do, Tiffany. You have to come see me. You're 14 at the time. And at the time, McBrayer attempts to blame Tiffany's mother. What's happening is she's put me in a position, Tiffany, to where I have to protect myself. There's nothing I can do. I love you. Do you still want to be with me? Yes. My mom won't let me see you. She's afraid that you're going to hurt me or something. I am not going to hurt you. Um, there are no restraining orders against you seeing me. Does your mother know? About the baby? Yes. Yeah, and she can't figure out whose it is. Okay, well, 
We have to sit down. We have to work this out. We have to talk it out. Okay? Yeah. Because all it's going to do is uh, ruin the rest of my life. However angry you get at me, you cannot use this as a weapon against me because you can ruin the rest of my life. This baby, it's going to look like mad or you. We need to talk. You're panicking, okay? Don't panic. My mom is going to hate me if I was pregnant with this baby. If she finds out, that will definitely happen. He admits it. I think. Yep. But it's all about him. It just kills me. I'm still fighting. But he's got a job, he's got a car, he's got a house. Should he ever be out of prison? Never. No, he should not. I will fight to let everybody know who and what he is. I will never let him hurt anybody else, ever. You know, I survived this by the grace of God. Grace, if not a miracle, are what Tiffany needs now more than ever. Up next, it's a fight to the finish all over again. Why would the parole board want a guy who raped an 11-year-old girl for three and a half years, up to four times a day, free? This is a travesty of justice. Tiffany Henderson has had more trauma in her life than most could ever handle. Sexually assaulted by her stepfather at the age of 11. That creep would go to prison for his crimes. And Tiffany would try to heal, sleeping better knowing he was behind bars. That is, until an unfathomable decision would bring her face to face with that monster once again. I want to feel happy. I want to feel that and I just don't. Only with great pain can Tiffany Henderson view the images of her young self or reflect on her childhood. I don't feel like I was ever a kid. Well, no, how could you be when somebody abused you? Finally, at 37 years old, she had been comforted knowing her stepfather, the sadistic man who raped and tortured her for almost four years as a child, was securely behind bars. He should rot in jail. Or so she thought until the day she realized Richard McBrayer had been paroled. How is it possible that Tiffany is at a traffic light on Easter Sunday and looks over and sees this man, her attacker? It's something out of a bad movie. I can't imagine how she must have felt at that moment when she realized, oh, there's my rapist. And now here he is in the street. And isn't it interesting that not only is he released, without them giving her notification, but that he's released into her neighborhood. Under Michigan state law, a victim must be notified six months prior to the release of an inmate. Tiffany says she would have shouted from the rafters to stop her brutal stepfather's release. How many parole hearings did you attend for him? Since 2009, I've been to 11. But tragically, this last time, she says the parole board didn't contact her. And we could have appealed this, and he would have never gotten out. Carrie Angie should know. She's the former assistant prosecutor who succeeded in keeping McBrayer, an ex-cop and a registered black belt, behind bars in a 2011 parole hearing. I've never seen a case this bad. To add outrage to insult, McBrayer served only about half the maximum 40-year sentence. Did you think while he was out, he would come and get you? Yes, I still believe that. Tiffany says she's been tenaciously keeping tabs on her rapist, but the parole board insists it was diligent in reaching out to Tiffany about McBrayer's impending release, saying victim notification is taken seriously by the Michigan Department of Corrections and all the proper steps were taken in this case. I'm not sure what kind of record they have of that. I haven't seen anything to prove that assertion. What's the biggest injustice here? It's known to them the kind of person he is. Not only do they have the full record in front of them, but they also have Tiffany appearing there every single time he comes up in person, um, tearfully relaying her memories of her childhood. He's danger to any child walking down the street. Look, this guy thinks he's smarter than all of us. He's a master manipulator, and eventually he's gonna grab another kid off the street. And Angie says he's a trolling, unrepentant pedophile 
who disgustingly referred to raping Tiffany countless times as a love story. He was raping your daughter up to four times a day. Yes. He'd take her down into the basement, which he built. How close did you come to committing suicide? Oh, I literally had, I have scars on my wrist where I literally cut them. What did he take from you? Honestly, I feel like the person I was. I died the minute he touched me. I lost everything about myself. Despite Tiffany's lifetime pain, the parole board set him free, even after he confessed to this. He has told his therapist that he continues to have interest in young girls, underage girls, and he blames Tiffany for the liaison. How a parole board can listen to that and, and find reasonable assurances of public safety and then release him into the street is a mystery to me. Is it possible that he's rehabilitated? Never. First of all, he has to admit what he did. He's never admitted what he did to me. Never, not once. For Tiffany, there is one small beam of bright light in her horrible nightmare. The circuit court has overturned the parole board's decision to release McBrayer early and threw him back in the county jail. That came after Tiffany filed a motion to have her former stepdad rearrested and to challenge the board's release. Angie says the original decision to release for good behavior and the rapist's claim of rehabilitation is nothing more than a con job. He indicated that he was going to be moving to Louisiana because he wanted to stay away from Tiffany and didn't want to be triggered by her. It was a non-existent address. And the next thing you know... Well, shouldn't they haul him back into prison just for that? I couldn't agree more. I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to let him out tomorrow. If he gets out again, Tiffany fears for her own teenage daughter. She doesn't want McBrayer anywhere near her fragile life. He used our love against each other. That's what he did. He used our love for each other against each other so that he didn't get caught. That's what they're like. And he's going to be on the street and we're serving up our children to this monster. Despite Tiffany's fears and despair, she's not about to give up. This was a 14-year-old girl who had the courage to put him behind bars by snaring him on tape, getting a near confession. Hey, Mom, pregnant. You have to come see me. She's certainly not going to let this perverted monster get his claws on anyone else. They took my right to appeal. They took my right to have my, my re-entry program. Her nightmare has a reprieve as McBrayer will sit behind bars until a decision is reached over whether he walks the streets again. If the parole board does prevail here and he does get let out, what are your biggest fears? I'm immediately concerned for Tiffany and her family. I think it's pretty clear from the record that he intended on killing her mother. And you listen to that tape, Chris. Uh, it sounds to me like he intended on killing Tiffany as well. What do you say to him now? It doesn't matter what I have to do, how painful it is, how hard my life is when I am away from this camera and I live every day in fear, in pain, afraid for my daughter, afraid for it. I will fight to keep him in it. He pled guilty to two counts, so serve your time. Now, we want to hear where you stand on this story. Do you think he did his time, or should this guy be forced to serve all 40 years of his sentence? Sound off now on our Facebook page. Coming up, they had a beautiful home in Hawaii, his and hers Maserati. But the FBI says this successful church-going couple was preying on innocent people. They were going after other fellow evangelical Christians to try to steal everything they owned. Now, they're on the run. I March Daily with a bizarre new tip, heating up the manhunt. That's next. Today, we're teaming up again with the FBI as they search for this couple. They seem to be living the dream. Fancy cars, expensive clothes, and big houses. But they also had one more thing, a secret life. Here's Anna Garcia. John and Julianne Dimitrian have been confounding and frustrating the FBI ever since the scoundrel slipped through their fingers. 
they thought of Oahu and Hawaii as their own personal treasure island. John and Julianne Dimitri were very much into the material trappings of the ultra-rich. A beautiful home with views of the South Pacific, a fleet of luxury cars, a booming real estate business, designer wardrobes, and a shining image as God-fearing pillars of the community. And they had all the outward signs of being extremely successful. But the Demetrians were really wolves in sheep clothing, the masterminds of a scam the FBI says ripped victims off for more than a million dollars. They never met a fraud they didn't like. Except for their fateful last one. I got scammed. This time, they picked the wrong victim, a feisty small businesswoman who would help bring their fool's paradise crashing down around them and land them both on the FBI's most wanted list. They had disappeared off the face of the earth. FBI headquarters, Honolulu. They haven't split apart. And so uh, do you have any other thoughts about something we should be doing? FBI Special Agent Tom Simon is working one of the most baffling and bizarre cases he's ever encountered. It's extremely unusual in the FBI, and I've been doing this for 20 years, to find a routine financial fraud spin into a domestic extremist investigation coupled with an international fugitive manhunt. Agent Simon picks up the story when the Demetrians married 10 years ago, painting a portrait of a young couple who only love one thing more than themselves and each other, and that's money. It wasn't just important for them to be wealthy, it was really important for them to make sure that everybody knew how wealthy they were. John, now 34, had been born into privilege as the son of a successful doctor who gave him the best of the best, including a private education at the same prestigious high school that counts President Obama among its alumni. And 32-year-old Julianne, who was raised in a working-class family, craved what she'd never had, wealth. The Demetrians shared lust for money, and every luxury it could buy literally becomes their religion. They have this odd philosophy that somehow they are destined by God to be rich. And the harder they pray, the richer they will get even if it means being heartless and dishonest, which Agent Simon says they were from the very beginning. You have to understand that John and Julianne are con artists, right? They're very good at talking people into doing things that are against their self-interest. One of the Demetrians' divinely inspired scams to make easy money fast was a light bulb they claimed magically purified the air and cured diseases. They were going on TV into home shows trying to sell this phony light bulb. And that wasn't their only bright idea to con people out of their money. They were involved in all sorts of different scams. But the most lucrative one is a real estate company they form called Mortgage Alliance with opulent suites in a downtown office tower looking out across Honolulu. And this time, their marketing gimmick is promising to save distressed homeowners from losing their properties to foreclosure. And they use that company to rip off a lot of people. The Demetrians make an ill-gotten fortune that they use to build the life of their dreams, which includes his and her Maseratis and other luxury cars, along with the finest designer outfits and most frivolous accessories money can buy. She actually at some point became addicted to buying expensive lingerie. Julianne even tries to get the government to pick up the tab. She went to her CPA and asked him if she would be able to put that lingerie down as a expense for tax purposes because she wore it under her clothing while she was at work. But there is misguided method to the Demetrian's money madness. They tried to spend the money as quickly as possible creating the illusion of more wealth to bring in other customers. The FBI says they also present an image as deeply religious, active members of a local evangelical Christian church. But the Demetrians, I believe, really used it as an opportunity to strengthen their bona fides in the community and make people think that they were, in fact, good, upright Christians who would never steal from them. And boy, were those people wrong who believed that. The Demetrians even prey upon the congregation they pray with. I thought they were really good Christian people. And the Demetrians figure Laura Christo for a sucker. Laura got into it because she thought she could help a fellow church member stay in their home. Next, 
Laura turns undercover FBI operative to expose just how John and Julianne Demetrian rip off distressed homeowners. I told them I can get all the information that you want. Welcome back. This couple appeared to have it all, but investigators say they were living a secret life in the vacation paradise of Hawaii, and their secrets were about to be exposed thanks to a fellow churchgoer wearing a wire for the Fed. Here's Anna Garcia. John and Julianne Demetrian have money to burn, which they do on every luxury that catches their greedy eyes. The Demetrians were actually pretty corny as far as their public presentation of their wealth. And that money they burn comes from distressed homeowners they also burned in a mortgage scam that promised to save them from repossession. We knew that they were spending that money on sports cars and luxury items, and none of this money was actually going to keep people in their houses. FBI Special Agent Tom Simon has already been quietly investigating the Demetrians, but doesn't have the evidence to bust them until he hears from one of their angry victims. Laura Christo. And Laura was so offended she actually came to the FBI and told us about the Demetrian's plan and she offered to help. I told them I can get all the information that you want. Laura is a member of the same fundamentalist Christian church the Demetrians attend and the couple are seen as God-fearing pillars of the community who would be trusted with people's money and their homes. They definitely used their church affiliation to harvest victims for their frauds. They were going after other fellow evangelical Christians to try to steal everything they owned. And the Demetrians hit the daily double with Laura and another member of the congregation who was facing foreclosure on their home. Laura Christo was a good-hearted woman who wanted to help out. And Laura has the means to do so as the owner of a successful Mexican restaurant. She has excellent credit that makes her a perfect target for the Demetrians' scam. I thought everything was legitimate. The Demetrians convince Laura that they can use her good credit to buy the house and their company will make the payments. That way, the other member of the congregation facing foreclosure will be able to stay in their home. When we went to the office with the Demetrians, it appeared to be everything normal, very luxurious office, everybody doing their jobs, everybody looked professional. There is also spiritual reassurance. The very first thing that you would see when you walk in that reception was a picture that read, with our help and God's help, we will make your dreams come true. Instead, the Demetrian's racket makes Laura's life a nightmare that will leave her with a foreclosed $250,000 home she never thought she even owned and her good credit in ruins. I receive a phone call from a mortgage company saying that I haven't paid, you know, for the house in the past four months. And I go, wait a minute, I'm not supposed even to be paying for that house. Laura realizes she's been ripped off and calls the FBI. What actually happened was the Demetrians took the profits from that sale and used the money for themselves, and then the original people that Laura was trying to help out got put out on the streets. Just like others who had fallen prey to the same scam that Agent Simon says made them $1.3 million. They don't care about leaving a family homeless and stranded. Laura is so angry she agrees to wear a wire and confront John Demetrian over the foreclosure on the house while Agent Simon listens in. I was just served yesterday with a foreclosure notice and really makes me mad because I'm not a liar. And I have all the documents here proving that what I disclosed, it's not what you guys put in the paper. John plays dumb. I just don't know anything about your loan right now because you're coming in here and you're yelling at me. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Well, of course I'm yelling at you because this is a big lie. I had no knowledge about how your transaction was put together or perceived. So it happens now because he's foreclosing on your house. Well, I wish I knew and that's why I'm here because if you guys don't help me out of this one, I'm going to go right now straight to the FBI and make a big storm over there and make it explode. That's what I'm gonna do. Now John gets combative. Don't threaten me because I'm I'm not fighting you. I'm telling you what I'm gonna I do said, because I on know, top of being- I know, but I'm saying I'm here to help you, okay? I'm here to help you. And the reason why is all this crap is, is hitting hard now. 
The reason why you can't threaten me is because I already know the FBI is all over me. Then John and wife Julianne get busted and plead guilty to mail fraud and money laundering. Laura was extremely brave. She was willing to actually help us gather the evidence that could put them away. But what happens while the Demetrians are free on bail awaiting sentencing stuns everyone. The Demetrians had apparently disappeared into thin air. Next, the hunt for the slippery scam artist begins. The FBI learns they have hooked up with an anti-government group with a connection to the Oklahoma City bombing and how they snuck out of Hawaii in disguise. We're back now with a secret life in Hawaii exposed. This couple, who appeared to have it all, is accused of defrauding people out of millions of dollars. Problem is, no one really knows where they are. Here's Anna Garcia. John and Julianne Demetrian's high life of luxury in Honolulu has suddenly become a paradise lost. They were basically sleeping on air mattresses in their parents' houses. Their conviction on mail fraud and money laundering charges for ripping off distressed homeowners has toppled their crooked mortgage company and taken the Demetrians from riches to rags almost overnight. They had nothing left. And a packed federal courthouse in Honolulu is in for a big surprise at their sentencing. The FBI agents are there, the prosecutors there, the judges there, the defense attorneys there. Everybody was there except for John and Julianne Demetrian. Didn't seem to be in court. I mean, I looked. I looked all over the courtroom. In fact, I think I called his name out a couple of times. Now he wasn't there. John and his wife were no shows. And I had no explanation. The Demetrians had surrendered their passports, and nobody expected them to bolt. The idea of them leaving and taking off and becoming fugitives was unthinkable. But fugitives, they have become. So the judge issues a bench warrant, and the fugitive hunt begins. By the time we actually got to them, they had spent through all the money. They were broke. Agent Simon is confident he will soon capture them close to home. These are people who didn't have money and didn't have passports to really go anywhere else. Agent Simon scours Honolulu and the island of Oahu looking for the couple, distributing wanted posters everywhere he goes. And obviously, if you see them, you just give me a call. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. He remains convinced the Demetrians are still on the island. He just can't find them. Now, this is Oahu. It's an island. You can only drive so far on it. So once we learned that they had not gotten on a plane, by checking the flight manifest for all the flights leaving Oahu recently, we had a real mystery on our hands. Where the heck were the Demetrians? Agent Simon enlists the help of the media. We were getting on local television here and getting their faces out there saying, hey, does anyone know where the Demetrians are? And every single one of those steps was coming up empty. Some of his fellow FBI agents think the Demetrians may have committed suicide. I never really bought it because the Demetrians were nothing if they're not narcissists. These people were so in love with each other and they felt that they were ordained by God to be rich and famous in the community. People like that generally don't kill themselves. Hi, Mrs. Smith. My name's Tom Simon. I'm an FBI special agent in Honolulu, Hawaii. How are you today? As news of the Demetrians going on the lam spreads, Agent Simon starts getting tips they may have been sighted on the mainland. Where do you think you saw the Demetrians? Okay, you believe it was at the Target in Niles, Illinois? None of the tips from the mainland pan out until Agent Simon gets an unexpected lead from an FBI informant that is almost too wild to believe. She contacted the FBI to tell us their story, and it was an amazing story, and it was nothing we saw coming. The informant says the Demetrians have joined an anti-government group called Sovereign Citizens, which counted among its members Terry Nichols, Timothy McVeigh's co-conspirator in the Oklahoma City bombing. Other Sovereign Citizen members also shot dead two Arkansas cops during a traffic stop. They don't believe that the laws of the U.S. apply to them, and they find themselves getting involved in all sorts of different financial frauds. And John Demetrian manages to con them, too. Convincing them that when they overthrow the U.S. government, that he would be a suitable Secretary of Treasury for this new Republic of the United States of America that they would form. To such an extent that they actually chartered a plane to get them away from Hawaii in a pretty elaborate scheme. 
John poses as a medical patient being taken to the mainland, and Julianne disguises herself as his nurse. His wife was wearing a, a, a rented nurse's outfit at an area where private jets come and go, and he was lying on a gurney, you know, with a, an IV in his arm. The Demetrians were flown to Utah, then driven to a secret hideout in Alabama, but they haven't been seen or heard from since, and they've now been on the lam for five years. It's clear to us that they've since moved on. We just don't know where. But Agent Simon is certain of one thing. Wherever they are, I know in my heart that they're stealing from people. And he believes the Demetrians will eventually trip themselves up. The idea that somehow the FBI is going to get tired of this manhunt and go away is preposterous. We're the FBI. That's not what we do. Since Crime Watch Daily first reported this story, the FBI says it's been flooded with sightings from around the world. Sightings of the Demetrians in Florida, San Francisco, Oregon, even as far away as the Philippines. So far, these tips have not panned out, but the FBI says it's confident they will one day bring this couple to justice. And they're hoping a $10,000 reward helps as well. If you have any information on the whereabouts of the Demetrians, you're asked to call your local FBI office. Still to come, as the ball dropped, the thieves made their move. This is not a typical burglary whatsoever. This is a very strange situation. Crime Watch Daily with all new details on the New York City jewelry heist. Was it an inside job? Next. Now to a huge story here in New York. If you're like me, you love the movie Ocean's Eleven about a crew of sophisticated criminals who pull off a huge robbery. Well, I wouldn't call these next guys sophisticated, but they certainly got the job done. Anchor Tamson Fidel from our affiliate PIX11 here in New York is here with the story. Fidel. Hey, Chris. Uh, they got the job done. No question about that. This is a crazy story. While the world was watching the ball drop here in Times Square, these guys were able to walk off with millions of dollars worth of jewels, and they were just blocks away from thousands of police officers. Somebody apparently didn't have their eyes on the ball when it ushered in 2017. Someone else had their eyes on $6 million worth of jewels. This is surveillance video of burglars breaking into the office of high-end jewelry designer Greg Roof. Popular with celebrities like Real Housewives of Atlanta star Candy Burris. When Candy got engaged to TV producer Todd Tucker, he gave her a diamond cluster sparkler from Greg Roof. Todd is great. Like our relationship is great. Everything is going well. The NYPD says the burglars walked into the building's front door around 10 p.m. and lied in wait until the new year was about to strike. Take a close look at these conniving crooks in action. One guy is hiding under a hoodie and a mask. But this guy is so brazen, he's not even covering his face. Armed with a crowbar and a hammer, they bash their way into the office. Then they realize they're on camera and it's lights out. Cops say what happens next, the thieves open the two safes and grab the loot. This is not a typical burglary whatsoever. This is a very strange situation. That's renowned safe expert Richard Krasilovsky from the Empire Safe Company in Midtown Manhattan. He tells Crime Watch Daily he thinks the burglars may have had some help. This is some sort of an inside job because the people who broke into the premises seem to have the copies of the combinations of the safes. They weren't breaking into the safe at all. All they were doing was opening it, which was done rather quickly. One of the men was reportedly seen on the phone, possibly getting the combination. Krasilovsky says today's safes are just about impossible to torch or drill into like these old clunkers. And what better cover than the craziness of New Year's Eve? The burglars did time it perfectly because that was their job. You know, that was their business, is to make sure that they could do the attack at the most opportune time. It was definitely a perfect opportunity because the whole area was cordoned off. And I think the, the alarm company had a really tough time getting in there because the alarm did go off, I believe, and, and they had a tough time getting to the premises. The Jewel Caper is just the latest in a series of multi-million dollar heists in the heart of Manhattan. A week earlier, on Christmas Eve, a daring smash and grab at a fur boutique on Madison Avenue. This guy barrels through the glass door. Then this knucklehead bursts in. Watch again 
he gets banged in the head with a steel beam, but it didn't stop his hot hands from grabbing the loot. Cops say the trio stole over a million dollars worth of Russian sable fur. In September, this guy helped himself to a bucket of gold flakes worth one and a half million dollars. A surveillance video shows him grabbing the gold from an armored truck. He carries it away, puts the heavy bucket down for a moment, then crosses the street, never to be seen again. Cops haven't caught him yet. He's reportedly on the lam in Orlando. And as for the jewel thieves, if they're caught, the only bracelets in their future will be the kind that lock. One more time, take a good look at this guy's face. If you know who he is, call the NYPD Crime Stoppers anonymously at 1-800-577-TIPS.